Hi folks, welcome to our 303 Din List presentation, Lunch and Learn series. Um, this is being presented by ECOS and Washington Stormwater Center. And the Department of Ecology is helping us out today with the presentation. Um, and the workshop is funded by the Bo Boeing Foundation. So thank you uh, to Lori and those others on this call that are from Boeing. Just a quick logistical thing. We are on Zoom, it's being recorded. And so it will be available after the fact if you would like to watch it again or um, ask for it for someone else. Uh, all attendees are muted and have their video off. You can ask questions using the toolbar at the bottom of the screen by clicking Q&A, or you can also ask questions in the chat if you're more comfortable for that as well. Um, you, when, I, I know there's a couple phone in, so maybe perhaps, I don't know if you can raise your hand or just unmute when we get to certain points, but what we're going to ask you is, um, you are welcome to ask questions at any time throughout the presentation, so that um, if you have questions in the moment on a slide and need clarification, we want you to be able to do that. So make sure that you do um, ask your questions as we go along. We figured there'll probably be a lot of questions at the end as well. So it's probably better to get the questions asked as we go. So my name is Ann Boyce and I'm a stormwater outreach program manager for ECOS. I've been there since 2011 and I host and manage the industrial stormwater management workshop program as well as the municipal stormwater training program. Um, I also do a lot of outreach to small non-permitted businesses uh, on pollution prevention and stormwater runoff doing spill kit trainings um, for small businesses. I do a lot of educating of businesses and recycling, composting, has waste handling, and fat soils and grease. I'm gonna turn this over to Lisa so she can introduce herself. Oop, wait, sorry. I, I'm okay. going to, sorry, ECOS is a nonprofit. We've been around for over 25 years. Um, we are, our key areas of focus are stormwater, rainwise, uh, LID and green stormwater infrastructure and recycling and solid waste. We do a lot of outreach and education. As you can see, our staff is multicultural. It's also multilingual. So we can provide um, education and training in language if necessary. We do employee trainings, such as coming out and doing spill response trainings for your um, business and forums and workshops. Lisa, now you. Okay, great. Thanks so much. I'm Lisa Rosman. I'm the assistant director of the Washington Stormwater Center. Um, and the Washington Stormwater Center is a collaboration between the University of Washington, Tacoma, and Washington State University. Um, we were founded about 10 years ago um, by the legislature, and we are here to, um, to provide assistance to businesses, municipalities, um, and others on their uh, Clean Water Act permitting. Um, we also do a lot of research. Um, in fact, one of our recent research projects was into the tire dust and what is killing coho salmon. Um, and we also um, do a number of other things such as um, LID workshops and, um, and trainings, online trainings. And we have a program that is called TAPE um, and it is the Emerging Technologies program that is run out of the University of Washington, Tacoma. Um, so with that, um, if you have any questions for me, you can always go to our, um, our website or you can contact us directly. Um, and I will turn it back over to Anne. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Travis Porter is with the Department of Ecology. He has the ISGT permit. So you're talking to the guy who wrote this whole thing for you. He's been with Ecology since 2017, which I can't believe you've been there that long, Travis. It seems like yesterday. 
Um, he spent some time down in Nebraska managing has waste and PDS and cleanup programs and training programs for environmental compliance. He was a permit writer for Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality, including uh, non stormwater general permit substantive requirements for Superfund sites and conducting and inspecting and technical assistance visits. He's got 20 years experience in the environmental field. Um, and it appears that he comes from a Nebraska or he spent a lot of time there. Um, just really quick overview of the workshop. Um, we are, what we try to do with these workshops is to fill an educational need for industry. We partner with a technical team to provide services for you and, and help you understand things. Uh, in a lay uh, person's way. Um, it's for people on the ground making the decision so that you can make the right decisions, hopefully. Um, typical stats for attendees at our industrial stormwater workshops, many of them are less than two years experience in stormwater, often one year or less, and often no engineering or science background. So you, um, I understand your challenges if you're in that, in this category. What we try to do is empower attendees with knowledge and tools needed to successfully manage your facility's stormwater program and help your company comply with the industrial stormwater permit requirements. So today's workshop content is about the 303 D list. What is it? Why should you care? Are you on the 303 D list? Hopefully you're here because you are, or you have a connection to somebody who is. Um, and how does the 303D list impact our business? Um, especially for those of you that may be new to it. Um, Travis will talk about that a bit more in depth. What is a total maximum daily load? What is the difference between benchmarks and numeric effluent limit or NELs? And then provide a resource and wrap up. Wrap up. So with that, I am going to stop share and hand it over to Travis. And I'm going to start sharing. Get it started. All right, and hopefully you all can hear me okay. Um, like Ann said, I'm Travis Porter. I've been with Ecology since 2017, and yes, it does seem like it was just yesterday. Although that's coming up on four years ago now, which is really weird to think about. Um, but we are talking today about uh, basically section six of the ISGP um, discharges to 303D listed impaired water bodies and what that might mean for facilities who have to do that um, compliance wise and, and things to kind of look out for. Just a quick background on what all this stems from. Uh, the 303D list is really it's not really a list, it's requirements under the Clean Water Act. Um, every two years, states are required to basically go over all their, their water quality data and update the list of impaired water bodies and submit those to EPA um, for both you know, awareness of that these streams are impaired, they're threatened, um, also to kind of prioritize what actions we're taking and, you know, TMDL actions and things of that nature to get these streams cleaned back up um, to basically meet the goal of the Clean Water Act, which is to restore and maintain basically all the waters. Um, easy way to think of that is keep them fishable and swimmable. Going over the impairments real quickly, I actually listed them here out of order on purpose because whoever decided to number these or name these at EPA a long time ago um, should not have named them. It's, it's confusing as crap. So the easy, well, not easy, but category four, B and five are really the two that we're concerned about. Four uh, B, they're impaired, but we don't need to do a TMBL on those because we either think that the stream is getting better, or we believe that through permitting actions, um, non-point source actions, education, we can get those streams back into 
uh, the non-impaired state um, without having to go through the whole TMDL mess. Category five, those are definitely threatened. Um, you know, definitely think of like the old school Cuyahoga River starting on fire. Um, we're not that bad, but category five, it's threatened. Fish are probably not doing so hot in those streams. Uh, the only way we're gonna get those back is to go through the TMDL process. Um, if they're category five, now there are TMDLs. They're, they're on the list to have a TMDL written for them. And then for some reason, they decided to do a category 4A, which doesn't really match because category 4As are impaired, but there's nothing more to do because they've already got a TMDL for them. So I don't really know why they've numbered them that way, but really the ones we're going to be focusing on today are the 4Bs and the 5s. So what is a TMDL or a total maximum daily load? Smarter people than I have the, the, the fun task of going through um, all the water quality data and they will calculate out based on the types of discharges to that water body, number of facilities, um, all that, and come up with a number that everybody can basically legally discharge that won't further impact that stream and will actually help it get better. Um, we call these waste load allocations. And so, for example, um, one that, that came up recently was the White River uh, around Tacoma. They're working on a TMDL. I don't know if that one's been approved yet or not, but it, it's gonna work for my example. They have multiple facilities, so a couple MS4 permittees some individual permits, some sand and gravel permittees, some industrial stormwater, construction stormwater permittees, all in this water body. And so what they had to do was look at each one of those permittees, the types of discharges they've got, and calculate up how much of that certain pollutant they're looking for. In this case, it's total residual phosphorus, and make a number of, during these times, this is how much you can discharge. And so that's the whole thought process behind what a TMDL is. Uh, as far as the ISGP is concerned, um, we do have the clause in there that if there's a TMDL, you have to comply with that TMDL. Um, so if you go and read those, whatever that number is, you've got to meet that number. They cannot be exceeded. So ISGP section six, um, that's why we're here. Uh, with that section six, if you're on a category five water body, you have a numeric effluent limit instead of a benchmark, at least for some of the parameters. Um, this came and, and actually created a lot of confusion this permit cycle because last permit cycle, we had a whole lot of streams go through that two year update and basically get impaired for zinc. Zinc was the big one. Uh, I think a few of them also had copper, but zinc really hit hard this time around for a lot of you folks. So what we did was we calculated the effluent limit for zinc and assigned those out and people were, you know, confused as to why they're getting this new number. Well, the benchmark in the permit is 117. That's, you know, a statewide benchmark. When we're talking these impaired water bodies, we actually had to go figure them out um, what the effluent limit is going to be. And so that number is actually lower. And that is a numeric effluent limit instead of a benchmark. So for those of you that are on the impaired water bodies, you now have an effluent limit instead of a benchmark for whatever parameter that is. In this case, um, using zinc, so you no longer have a zinc benchmark, you have a zinc effluent limit. Um, we also have requirements in there for the Puget Sound sediment cleanup sites. Those were sites where, you know, the historical long-term pollution really damaged and impaired those, those areas. The sediment was really nasty. Um, ecology and other folks, EPA, um, private citizen groups, uh, I think even grants through some of you folks helped clean those sediment areas up. And so we included requirements to also protect those areas. Um, and that's also tied to section six. Quick question, Travis, or two yes. actually. Okay. There is a new 303D list out for review. 
do you think it will be approved by EPA before the 2025 permit renewal? Probably. Um, since they're done every two years, there's a really good chance that you're going to have two lists go through that review and possibly approval. Okay. And then um, thanks for doing the workshop. Have you heard if ecology is considering revising the aquatic life standard for copper or zinc? If yes, would that impact either the benchmark level or any NELs in future permits? I haven't heard anything from the water, stand, water quality standards group on adjusting that. Um, if they, if they did have to adjust copper, that would, I mean, it would affect every single permit that's got copper in it. Um, that would affect benchmarks and effluent limits. Uh, to what degree, I don't know. It kind of depends on, on one, how it changes and two, what they, or what criteria they use to change it. Okay. Thank you. So talking about the difference between what a benchmark is and what an effluent limit is. Um, no matter what anybody says, a benchmark by itself is not a numeric effluent limit. Um, this has been litigated off and on. PCHB has ruled on it. I think back in the day, um, certain third party groups tried to say, oh, you exceeded the benchmark, so therefore, You've, you've done a bad thing, we're going to sue you. Um, time and time again, they, they, they've lost that argument just because somebody exceeds a benchmark doesn't necessarily mean that they're out of compliance with the permit. Um, the reason we can use benchmarks is we tie the benchmark itself to a corrective action. And I think this is the, the part of the permit where most of you are probably familiar with where you exceed a benchmark a certain number of times throughout a calendar year, and it triggers certain actions that you have to do to come back into compliance. And we, we tie that all together, and that's part of a bigger, what we call a narrative effluent limit. So it's benchmark plus corrective actions equals this narrative thing that you have to do. So exceeding of a benchmark alone, not a, not a violation. It's when you exceed a benchmark and don't do a corrective action, that's where the violation comes in. Now, the whole purpose of today is the numeric effluent limits that some of you are, are now dealing with and exceeding one of those is in fact a violation of the permit. Um, there are no corrective actions tied to the effluent limit. So it, it's completely different than how the benchmark works. Effluent limits, you have to meet those all the time. Benchmarks, if you exceed it, then you have to do whatever corrective action you have triggered. So what this means when you're, when you're looking at your permit coverage sheets, um, since this is new for a lot of you and, and this is when you really noticed it, um, effluent limits are assigned at time of coverage. So for all of you permittees who were, you know, had your permit back in 2015, if this is something new for you, you notice that this really hit January 1 of 2020. Uh, new permittees, um, aside from the other requirements of section six that they have to show that they're not a, you know, further impairing that stream, um, they're also gonna get those effluent limits when they apply. Bear in mind that generally what we, we don't go back, you know, the question was the 303D list under review now, if that changes during this permit cycle, we're not gonna go look at those streams, go back and redo everybody's monitoring points and assign that low limits. We do those when the permit rolls over. We just don't have the staff, we don't have the time. It, it takes way too much work um, to go back through those. So what we do is when you reapply and we have to go back over all those monitoring points anyway, that's when we start looking at the atlas and seeing who's on impaired water bodies again. I will say that with an asterisk because there are certain modifications. Um, basically, if you end up discharging to a, you know, you modify your site, something happens, um, you're now shifting all of your storm water from the east side of your site to the west side, and that's now a discharge to an impaired water body. 
you're going to get an effluent limit for that new water body that you're discharging to. Um, that's really the only time that ever would happen uh, for those existing permittees. Otherwise, you know, when that new permit rolls around, that's when you get your effluent limit assigned. The way we did it this time, again, I think when I pulled the last list, when we were trying to figure out how we were going to do this, um, it was something like 3,000 monitoring points were now on impaired water bodies or on new impaired water bodies for the 2020 permit. Um, again, the bulk of those were for copper and zinc and mostly on the west side. There was really no way to go back and calculate individual effluent limits for each one of those sites. Um, and we, we struggled with that a little bit. Um, came up with the idea that we were going to go and, and do it on an east side, west side data set. And so we pulled the last 10 years worth of data that EAP had collected from both sides, um, as many monitoring points as we could get and, and went off the, the hardness for the west side and the east side and calculated those out based on that. Um, instead of taking probably what it would have taken two years to pull all that data for each individual site. Um, like I said, that it was something like 3000 monitoring points that now have effluent limits tied to them um, because of that switch. Uh, the other thing we did this permit cycle, it was removed last permit cycle. We're not sure why, I'm guessing somebody got created with the delete button, um, but you've got the compliance schedule back. So for you facilities who were dealing with a benchmark previously. So I'm going to use zinc again as the example. In 2015, you had a zinc benchmark. 2020, you now have a zinc effluent limit. You have a compliance schedule built in until January 1st of 2022. And the reason we put that back in was really thinking about it, you know, permittees who have been dealing with that benchmark of 117 may have installed treatment to hit 117. And now they're trying to target a lower number. Um, and so this gives them two years to really dial in their new treatment, um, get that system upgrade done, sample, figure out where they're missing, what's working, what's not, and get those treatment systems dialed in. Um, so that's that date's coming up. You got, I think, eight more months before that date really hits. So um, hopefully most of you are, are getting that dialed in. Travis, we got a couple of additional questions. Okay. Are the benchmarks and effluent limits in force in parallel, or does the effluent limit replace the benchmark? The effluent limit replaces the benchmark. Okay. And then another question. We usually average all of our required monitoring parameters except pH recorded individually. In our memo to ecology, we add in a table with the averages of all our values. We have benchmarks for fecal coliforms and E. coli. Should we report straight averages or geomean averages for these two parameters? And they do not have a numerical limit on fecal or E. coli. Yes, with fecal and E. coli and enterococci, there are no actual numerical limits. It's a report only. However, there are BMPs in the footnotes of that table um, or a note on BMPs about, you know, doing extra things to, to try to keep those numbers down. Um, the question on which, if it's the straight average or the geo mean, um, whoever had that question, if you could send me that email and I need to look at that and get back to you. I believe it's the actual, I think it's the geo mean when you're talking E. coli. I have to go back and actually look at the standard again. I think that was, was there another part of that question or did I hit there, uh, no, I think you're good. Uh, there is one more, and I think you're going to probably answer it later. But could you identify the specific impaired water bodies? I can't. 
identify the specific ones, except I can tell you where they are located so you can find those. And I will do that on a couple slides later. Thanks, Travis. Uh, so what you're seeing now is, is it's a clip from table six um, that's in section six of the permit. And this is the effluent limits assigned to those Cat 5 303D listed water bodies. And a couple notes, what you're gonna see, um, and a big change this year was the change from straight fecal to getting fecal and E. coli if you're on freshwater or fecal and enterococci if you're on marine waters. Reason being for that one is the water quality standards are actually changing on how we're looking at bacteria. And so eventually fecal coliform is going to drop off. Um, we still need fecal coliform because the state still uses that information for opening and closing shellfish grounds. Um, but once they start figuring out the, the correlation between E. coli and fecal, um, fecal is going to drop off. And then we'll just go straight to an E. coli and, or enterococci, depending on if you're freshwater or marine. Um, the other thing to note here is a lot of the, you know, maximum daily areas, and I'm hoping my little arrow here works, yes, are all footnote G. And what G is, is assigned at time of issuance. And that's because these parameters all require some sort of other information in order to calculate that number. It's not a straight um, number with the exception of the metals to marine discharges, we could have put those in and we didn't. Um, and we got called out for that during the appeal and that's likely gonna be fixed next permit cycle. So the marine will actually have the number in here because uh, that doesn't change. Um, but again, for the freshwater side, especially you know ammonia, copper and lead. And I think we've only had one ammonia that I'm aware of that we had to calculate out um, for ammonia. You know, you gotta know whether it's a salmon stream or not. And then the temperature, and something else. Um, copper, lead, and zinc, they're all hardness based. And so we have to go, you know, figure out what hardness we're going to use. And like I said, this time around, we did an east side, west side on the hardness. And then pentachlorophenol is very susceptible or, or very variant on pH. Um, it jumps around a lot if the pH even moves slightly. So uh, that one, it used to be a straight number, and we we took that back out because we had some differing data on pHs for pentachlorophenol. And I have only seen, I believe two facilities actually get that effluent limit assigned to them. I don't believe we have any other ones. Um, but again, this time around, a lot of copper and a lot of zinc got assigned. Oops. And yeah, and the next slide is going to show this too. But the other thing to remember is this is a maximum daily discharge. This isn't a quarterly average. Um, and so that's going to be the big difference between the benchmark and the effluent limit is this is maximum daily versus quarterly. Although the sampling frequency is still once a quarter, your number is based on a maximum daily discharge. So what this means for compliance. Um, you don't have that luxury of, of trying to average down a benchmark. Um, in some cases, the extra sampling can actually assist you on a benchmark. You know, you can, you can take five samples and, and get that average down to where you're not having to do corrective actions. With an effluent limit, um, if you're out of compliance, you're probably not gonna wanna sample again because that could generate a second violation because once you exceed, you're already in violation. However, if you did fix something, you may want to sample again to show that you're no longer in violation. So um, those are things that, that as a facility or as a consultant, you're going to want to start thinking about is, you know, how often you're going to want to sample these. Um, if you're in compliance that, that once a quarter, that's, you know, and you're showing that, that's good. If you're out of compliance, um, you may not want to sample that again until you upgrade treatment or do additional source control or something to make sure you're back into compliance. Uh, like I said before, there's no corrective action schedule. So when an effluent limit, a numeric effluent limit is exceeded, that's that it's generating an automatic violation. 
um, you, but you're also not tied to those corrective actions. So you're not tied to a level two where, or a level three, you can do whatever you need to do in order to, to address those violations. So, you know, again, level twos and the benchmarks, you know, it's source control, level three is treatment. With an effluent limit, it doesn't matter. If you think extra sweeping is gonna do it, do your extra sweeping and sample and find out. Um, if you think a whole new treatment train is gonna do it, that's what you need to do. Um, and also with that, you, you don't have that waiver or time extension allowance. Um, with numeric effluent limits, it's everything's very immediate and very final. Um, also what that means for compliance is you know, there's always that fear of, oh my God, I just, I, just, I got a violation. What do I do? A single violation isn't necessarily going to get you into trouble. It might, I mean, depending on what third party's watching you and what you've done in the past, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I can't speak for them. You know, they might have their agenda or whatever. Speaking kind of from a, I'm not an inspector anymore, but when I used to do inspecting, you know, we always had that kind of, okay, did they violate once? Yeah, okay. How have they fixed it? Well, here's how they've addressed it. Okay, that's that's good enough. You know, they're in compliance. Or if they're just always out of compliance, never doing something to fix it, then that's where you're going to start seeing the inspector uh, really grab attention and, and start coming down on you guys. So what to do after, you know, you, you flag that violation, you know, basically you got to do whatever it takes to get back into compliance. And by that, you got to do whatever it takes to get that discharge back down to that number. Um, you got to call us within 24 hours uh, or, or shoot us an email. Um, so, and that's within 24 hours of basically getting your sample results back. Cause you're not going to know right off the bat when you take that sample, if you're out of compliance, unless it's just, completely muddy, then you're like, hey, there's probably a problem. Um, notify us within 24 hours, uh, written notification within five days. We can waive that. That's entirely up to you. Um, coming from a, the side where I, I wasn't the inspector, I was the person getting the notice of violation. Um, I always did the written anyway, whether or not they wanted it or not, because it was kind of a CYA thing for myself. Um, so just bear that in mind and, and you know, do whatever you want to do. Um, but within that written, tell us what happened, tell us what you're going to do to kind of fix the problem. And, and you know, you begin addressing the problem. You're not going to have necessarily a full fix within five days. It's just, you know, especially if it's a treatment train type issue, there might be a consultant out there who can diagnose, order things and have it in place within five days. But if, they are in fact out there, then they're probably very, very expensive and not everybody can afford that. Um, just know that, you know, hey, we've hired somebody, they're looking into it, or we think it's a treatment train issue, we're going to attempt these steps. You know, you don't have to go into great, great detail, but the more detail you provide us, the better it shows what you're going to do, that you're moving back towards compliance. And then, you know, we can use enforcement discretion on that. Like I said, generally a single violation isn't necessarily going to bring out, you know, the inspectors in full force with their little notepads and, ah, oh, you did bad, we're going to find you. No, it's, it's usually a history of violations. Um, if you're up front, you, you answer the questions, you, you know, open those lines of communication up with ecology uh, one that's going to show that you're actively attempting to come back into compliance. Um, it's going to look better, especially, you know, I don't know how it looks to third parties, but it's going to make it a little harder for a lawsuit to stick if, you know, they're going to show that, hey, we're coming back into, via, or into compliance. Um, it, it just helps. The other thing to bear in mind, too, with all that is I think it was two or three years ago, the feds actually upped the third party lawsuit amount. Um, it's now 50,000 plus dollars a day per violation. So the quicker you're back into compliance and you take that extra sample and show that, hey, look, we're back into compliance, um, they can't really add days onto that. Um, so 
for instance, if they did tag somebody for being out of compliance, um, say, you know, full three quarters of compliance, that's three quarters times however many days at $50,000 a day is a lot. Um, if, if you can show that you've come back into compliance within a week, you know, 50,000 times seven days is, is a lot less. Um, granted, they don't always get their full 50 plus, but just to kind of give you an example of how this might play out um, if, if things get too bad. And the last thing, which is always a thing with industrial stormwater general permit is to update that SWIP, you know, explain in there what happened, keep those sampling results, keep the, the communication with ecology, the notifications that you gave us. So that way you just always got them. You can show that. And, and anything you do to, to fix that issue, make sure that's in the SWIP. So that way anybody looking at that can figure that out. Quick question, Travis. Yep. Or maybe two. Uh, you can do a daily average for NEL if desired, correct? I think there's a, there is a note like that in the ISGP. Yes, you can do a daily average. Um, again, the averages can either hurt you or help you. So just bear that in mind if you want to do the averages. And then uh, with the new 303D list out now, what happens to discharge points that were but would no longer be under 303D listings with the new listings? Does a permittee have to wait until the next cycle to no longer be under those effluent limits? Yes, and there may be a few on there, but I, my recollection is, is if, if, especially the cat fives, the only way they're coming off that list is if they've got a TMDL um, and then you're stuck with whatever that TMDL states as, as the requirement, if that makes sense. I mean, there might be a, a few of the, the four A's coming off or the four B's rather, the four B's coming off um, because for whatever reason, we've, we've got those under control. Um, but again, those will be reevaluated the next permit cycle. Okay, another quick question, or maybe not so quick, but uh, once an effluent violation takes place, presumably it will take time to remedy and improve results, and it may rain during that implementation period. I'm assuming all future samples will continue to be violations until the remedy is in place. Is that correct? Possibly, and I, and I, I say that with a giant asterisk because it really depends on what at that facility is causing that violation. Um, in, in several cases, it may be as simple as, you know, coming in and really, you know, upping your sweeping from once a month to once a week, that may be enough to actually drop that number down or moving something indoors that might be leaching. And I'll keep using zinc because it's the easy one. You know, you, you find that roll of rolled up chain link fence next to the building and you grab it and you move it inside that might actually be enough to bring that number down. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's your entire building and roof structure are uncoated zinc, that's what's leaching off. Yeah, you're, you're gonna be out of, bio, out of compliance until all of that is taken care of. Um, but that's where your communication with ecology is really important and really comes into play because you know, if that's what you determine to be the problem, it's going to take time and it may be beneficial to actually enter into an agreed order with ecology where you and the inspector and that region sit down and you kind of decide, okay, here's the steps we're going to take, but here's how long it's going to take us to fully encapsulate our building in zinc-free paint and put this treatment thing in. And it's going to take us this long to do it. We can write an order for you to continue sampling, meet these dates, and then you're, you're in compliance. Um, now, granted, 
third party could still come in and appeal that order. Um, but it would be very difficult for them to do so if the end goal is is within reason. You know, if it's hey, it's going to take us a year to do this. That's that's a pretty you know minimal time frame in the grand scheme of things. That's very easy for them to to say yes, that's that's correct. Versus hey, it's going to take us you know 15 years to to put a catch base and insert in. No, no, it's not. Uh, and, and granted, those are very extreme examples, but you know, just you know, keep those those lines of communication open. And if it boils down to it, we can we can work with facilities um, where we know that they've narrowed down the problem, and the problem is a big type issue where we need to do something extra. Thanks, Travis. So kind of next steps, and we've touched on this a little bit, um, that we, you know, we have to reevaluate the limits every permit cycle because again, those 303D lists are reviewed every two years. So, you know, next permit cycle, we may have different limits. Uh, we may have different streams that are impaired. We may have different parameters. We we don't fully know. I mean, they could generally the, the list of parameters we have. Or what you're going to find in stormwater. Um, there's really not much more than that. There might be a few, um, but those are the, the the main ones that we're focusing on and finding, and that the streams are getting impaired for. Um, so the list I don't think will change much. Standards, water quality standards may change. So, you know, they may end up with a different copper equation, and then we'll have to go through and recalculate copper. So in 2025. There could be a new copper limit and there also could be a new copper benchmark if they do in fact change that and i haven't heard if they are or not so i don't know if they are um but you know each reissuance process will look at that um if your stream was taken off then yeah you're back to benchmarks um if you've got a new stream you might have more discharge points that are now impaired so bear that in mind um just because it's updated and it's, it does go both ways, but if the new 303D list comes out, say next week, and there's a hundred more streams on there that are impaired, we're not going to go pull up every facility on those 100 streams and add ethanol limits to those coverages. That will happen next permit cycle. Uh, and the, the kind of the last thing to to really think about, especially on those Cat 5 water bodies, is the only way they're gonna get addressed is the TMDLs. Those TMDLs may contain a waste load allocation. And I say may mostly for the bacteria one because I just saw one that got issued last year that doesn't actually have a numeric thing or trigger in it for industrial storm water on bacteria. And that's up in, Skagit County, I believe. Um, I mentioned the White River TMB on Tacoma. That one does have a waste load allocation for industrial stormwater permittees. Um, I don't believe that one's approved yet. So that one probably won't take effect until 2025. It's, it's kind of an odd one. It's a pH impairment that is attributed to total residual phosphorus. And it's during the dry season, so it's it's really weirdly written. And we reviewed it and, and, and made our comments and tried to make it as, as painless as possible. Um, but what it is, is, is during summer low time flows, if you have a discharge from your facility and the river is below a certain point, then you have to meet a certain number of, of total residual phosphorus. Um, that's just one example. So when they when they do the TMDLs, um, bear in mind there may, there may be waste load allocations, and there will be I think from now on for stormwater they've they've really started figuring out that they need to do that. Um, they can't just leave that allocation as zero because we do need at least some level of allocation and and some level of discharge for those. Um, TMDL process I believe is the same as a permit where they do open it for comments. Um, or at least review ahead of time. So you should be able to pull those up. And I believe 
and has a handout with the link. If not, let me know. And I, I've actually got the link right here. Um, it's the third link there. That is the one where you can actually review the TMDLs that are as they're coming out um, and kind of get a, a feel of what the waste load allocation is going to be. Um, the, the three links here, the water quality atlas link, the very top one, that is where you go to see if you're discharging to an impaired water body. Um, you can zoom in, figure out where your discharge point goes. If it goes to this, you know, whatever stream, you click on that and it'll bring up what it's impaired for, if it's impaired, um, and, and for what parameters. Uh, the next one down is the water quality standards group page. They're the ones, you know, again, doing the, the if they're going to change any of the water quality standards, say copper, um, that's the group that will do it. All their information is posted there. And then the directory of TMDL stuff, um, which is where you would go to review any TMDLs that may be coming out in the future. Um, again, those TMDLs are likely to have even more stringent limits than what the effluent limit is, um, as well as any other requirements like uh, reporting during certain times of the year or things of that nature. And with that, I'm gonna leave this up since, since we are teleworking, email is definitely the best way. Um, although lately I've been getting several hundred a day, but email is always the quickest because I am not at my desk anymore. So, but I think we do have time for questions now. Any more questions? Anybody want to speak? I think we can let you speak perhaps if you want to. No questions, all questions have been asked. You can use the Q&A, you can use the chat box. It, uh, there's a request to go back one slide, please. Here we go. Uh, and if you, you, if want you want these links, um, like I said, Ann should, I think Ann had a handout or they're on the one um, thing sent to you all. If not, just shoot me an email and I can copy these out and paste them and send them right back to you. Um, yep. I, sorry, I, I sent a PDF of both your presentation and our presentation and both presentations have links in it. If they're not accessible because they're PDFs, um, I can also include them in an email to everybody on a follow-up, as well as a link to access this presentation so that you can watch it over the next 30 days if you'd like to re-watch it. Yeah. Oh, I, one question. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, I can let you talk, Lori. Hold on just a second. I think, are you in there? There we are. Uh, oh, allow to talk. Okay. I think you can talk. Hi. Hi, Travis. It's Lori Blair. How are you? Good. How are you, Lori? Pretty good. So, hey, thanks. I love this presentation. Thank you so much. I have a um, quick question on vehicle coliform. Since I know I can't remember off the top of my head when the dates are that it phases out, but I did see that there was a couple of new 303D listings in the proposed list right now. Um, by the time we get to the 2025 permit, do you think that would be, how is that going to work, right? Because there's a phase and uh, if it's listed now for vehicle coliform, but then the, it drops off, but it's on the list, now, that, that'll seem kind of weird as far as the permit goes. Or will you just adjust the permit to the E. coli or the enteric, I can't say the other word, enterococci? Um, we'll, we'll adjust the permit. And that's, you know, that's one of the things I can't remember right off the top of my head, what the implementation plan had for the dates on fecal dropping off. Um, I thought it was before the 2025 permit. Uh, so that's why I was thinking that was going to, you know, next permit cycle fecal was probably not going to be on there. And it was just going to be straight either E. coli or enterococci. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely sure because I thought it somehow played with how they 
review the data they get from like the current time frames on E. coli and the fecal numbers. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a purpose. challenge. The, the current listing is based on data from like 2015 to 2018, and that was before they updated the policy. So I totally get it that all they have right now is Beagle Cola Farm kind of. So it's just so we'll we'll just stay in touch between now and 25 and figure it out, I'm sure. And then I know this isn't necessarily 303D question, and it's okay if you don't know the answer, but you know, um, I was just on a call with the Washington Stormwater Center and we're talking about um, 6PPD-Q. Don't ask me to actually say the chemical name because that's a tongue twister. Um, do you, are there any thoughts on the policy side of whether or not that might become a monitor? And I'm really being really not a nice person asking you to answer this question right now because I don't want to put you on the spot. But just what are your thoughts about that chemical and um, what, you know, is there stuff we could do now or, you know, trying to think about, you know, how to get best prepared for any emerging pollutants that might hit the 2025 so that we're ahead of the game. And, and I'm personally really concerned about the chemical on a personal, from a personal point of view. So, yeah, six, six PPD quinone. Um, for those of you who don't know, was recently that was kind of the, the they finally figured out that oh this is the mystery thing that's that's killing juvenile coho um, or, or juvenile salmon in the stormwater runoff. It was the toxic the toxicity portion of that that they were missing um, all this time. They they finally narrowed it down. Um, we are still in the very early stages of that. Um, they're they're looking at one why why it's coming out the way it does um it appears from what i can gather of this that it's mostly coming out of like the tire dust so the tires so uh, any way that you can control tire dust or the you know any of that type of stuff that's where it really seems to be coming from a lot of um but i know they've also are struggling with how how to best treat it what kind of bmps and, and treatment trains are we going to be looking at to try to treat that because i think it also has a tendency to bind up as well or, or it can be problematic um it, it's one of those things where i mean this just came out i think up a couple months ago and we still don't know the full ramification of what's going on i would expect by 2025 that we're going to see at least some sort of monitoring for it. Um, I don't know if they're going to have a standard developed for it, but I'm I'm guessing that we're going to have at least a monitoring and a, a analytical method available for that parameter, and that will have to be included into um, the permit somehow. I don't fully know how we're going to do that yet. Um, like I said, we're still still in the very infancy stages of, of, hey, we just now figured this out. Great. Now, what do we do? Okay. And and since we're talking about the permit renewal, I was just curious. I know many years ago, um, before the permit was renewed, they had like a workshop where they, like not just the public public meetings, but actually, you know, like talked with people and you know, is there some innovative innovative ideas that we can maybe incorporate or expand? And I know I've been on the um, so yeah, this is Lori Blair. Sorry, still I'm uh, I'm not muted. So haha. Um, uh, so I've you know I've been on the Our Green Duwamish um, team for a while now, and we've been you know really thinking about it's such a safe place to come up with crazy ideas um, and talk about them. And so. Just something you don't have to answer right now, but just something to think about that, you know, there are so many innovative um, things happening right now with the heat map um, uh, that uh, Geocentech and the Nature Conservancy is developing. We've, you know, there's all these efforts and all these watersheds that that are so exciting. Um, the permeable pavement project and, you know, we've got some smart technology that we've been researching for green infrastructure um, there's just a lot of innovation going on. And I think it'd be awesome if there's some way we could like 
maybe in 2023. Um, so it's not the pressure of the permit renewal, but maybe we could just have some like talking sessions with you and like a bunch of us, right? Not just, not just definitely not just Boeing, but uh, you know, a bunch of us and like what works, what doesn't work. And maybe the stormwater center and ECOS can, can help facilitate all that. And, um, you know, just, you know, just some idea, just an idea to think about because 2025 is, you know, it's a bit of ways away. So we have time to think about it. Yeah, it's, it's a little ways away, but as quick as this last year and change have gone, it's going to be here before we know it. <laughs> but I, I know what you're talking about. We have done that in the past. And I think, and I don't know if Boeing was, and, I, and I'm picking on you, Lori, because I can, because you unmuted yourself. I don't know if Boeing was in on that original letter, um, but I thought a group of permittees had gone to um, Maya to kind of try to get something going for the 2025 permit reissuance um, when Director Bellin was still here. Um, as, as many of you may or may not know, Director, Director Bellin moved on and now Director Watson is in that spot. Um, and I don't I know. didn't know about that. Oh, yes, I'm sad Maya. I wasn't part of that. Oh my gosh. So um, now we have Director Watson. Uh, there is a, I think there is a formal process you go through to get this, like the stakeholder group thing back together. Um, oh. It's, I think it's on our webpage. I, okay. If I'll I can follow find up with an link, email to you. I'll follow up with an email to you and we can, and I don't want to take everybody else's time that's on this call. And um, cause that's easy for me to do. So I want to be, you know, respectful of everybody else in case they have questions, but yeah, I'll follow up with you afterwards. Yeah. That's this good. Is awesome. I'll, I'll actually, if I find the link, I will send it to Ann and Lisa to blast out to everybody else as well. Um, if that is something that you guys are interested in doing again, um, because there, there is a formal process and it would be interesting to see, you know, how many folks would like to do that. So I'll send that to, to Ann and Lisa to blast out to all of you uh, as soon as I can find it. That would be great, Travis. And I, um, I do have several questions. Um, this one says, I don't see the NELs referenced on my web DMR, only benchmarks. Will this be updated to have benchmarks replaced by NELs? If it's the lower NEL number instead of the benchmark, yes. And the reason being was that compliance schedule, that two-year compliance schedule, um, while that's in place, so that way you're just not generating violation after violation after violation, um, we leave them as benchmarks. And then January 1st of 2022, those should go from a benchmark to a limit. And I will confirm that with IT. Um, last I checked, we were still on that sort of schedule that was supposed to happen automatically. But since you say that, and I know how well computers work, I want to double check that for sure. Okay. Um, I also, I see the Duwamish is being targeted for ammonia and none of our benchmarks are related to ammonia. I may be confused. Um, and there might be, if the stream's impaired, um, you'll still get the ammonia. Um, but for some reason, I don't recall the ammonia effluent limit for the Wamish. I don't, it might not be a Cat 5. I know there's a TMDL for ammonia, but I thought that was strictly for the wastewater plant upstream, but I, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't had to actually go look at the atlas to figure out on the Duwamish. Okay. Um, are you anticipating PFAS benchmarks or effluent limits in future general permits, or maybe only case-by-case -case basis? Any insights? Yeah, on PFAS, PFOA, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't seen any movement in the standards group. Likely, if, if we do it for the ISGP, it's probably going to be on a case-by-case -case basis um, where we find it or, or we 
you know, recognize those hot spots. Um, I don't, I don't, unless something changes in the next, you know, next two years with the standards group, I don't see it really coming in. Um, at least not as an effluent limit or a benchmark. Uh, it might be one of those report only type scenarios, kind of like the, the FIGL or the new groups that we did um, where it's, it's not a, a set number. It's, you know, tell us what's discharging. Um, but with PFOS and PFOA, the sampling for that is really, really difficult. Um, in fact, your sampling gear itself can actually really throw those tests off. And so I think they, they need to get a better wrap or a better understanding of analytical methods and how to sample for that before um, we're going to be incorporating any sort of benchmark or limit into the permit for PFAS. Okay. Also, um, would you please spend some time talking about S6A, specifically what indirectly or directly or indirectly through a stormwater drainage system means in terms of pipes, ditches, streams, et cetera. Permittees that discharge to an impaired water body either directly or indirectly through a stormwater drainage system shall conduct sampling and inspections in accordance with conditions S4, S5, S6, and S7. Thanks. Yeah, and that's mostly uh, the, the best way to think about that are the MS4 systems. Um, if you discharge to an MS4 system that discharges to an impaired water body, then you're still stuck with the impaired water body standards. Um, so for those of you in, in you know, highly urban areas, i.e. Tacoma, Seattle, Olympia, even to a smaller degree, um, if, if you're discharging to that, the storm sewer that the city has, um, that's their MS4 system and it discharges say uh, to the impaired river um, two miles down the way, that's gonna be your discharge location is where that MS4 system discharges. I will say that gets really, really, really tricky in certain areas. Um, and it may be beneficial for some of you and it's not easy to do. I recognize that it, it's, it's quite problematic. I actually had somebody do that for us on the other side of the mountains where we were pretty sure the MS4 system did not discharge there. The permittee was pretty sure, we were pretty sure, but somebody else was saying, no, it definitely discharges at this river. Um, and the permittee finally got a hold of the city, the city maps, traced the drainage system and showed that it in fact did not discharge that impaired water body. We were able to change that. Um, so if, it, if it's going to like the city owned MS4 storm sewer system that ends up in an impaired water body, uh, you're held to those limits. If you're discharging to a, a water body upstream of an impaired water body and that water body itself isn't impaired, you're not. Um, but it's, if it's the, you know, the, the man-made or the part of that MS4 system, that's, that's what that S1A is, or S6A is talking about, that, that indirectly. So you have a, a direct discharge to an MS4 that's an in, direct discharge to an impaired water body for you. Okay, that's the last question I have so far. Are there any additional questions that you have for Travis? And while you're thinking of questions, I will kind of warn some of you, um, and, and I don't know how many have probably heard us talking before this started, you know, we are down several inspectors, especially on the ISGP side right now. Um, we, we've, we've had two retirements and one person that's out on leave temporarily. Um, we're trying to get more people back in, um, but with this shutdown happening and the hiring freeze, um, it's been tough and you're going to see probably some new faces coming and going. Um, so, so bear with your inspectors. Um, I, I think some of them are kind of feeling the pressure with picking up slack from retired or you know, open positions where they may not be fully aware of what's going on at your site. Um, it might, might take them some time to come up to speed. Um, but we do have some new folks 
I believe Northwest actually has two new industrial inspectors. I've, I haven't met them. They came on during this time. So hopefully some of you may actually get the chance to meet them. Um, and I, I saw yesterday opened uh, the one for if most of you or some of you may know Kevin Hancock at Southwest. He retired. Um, they opened his position. So that one will be hired here shortly. It looks like we have one more question. Um, and I'll go ahead and read that one if that's okay. We still have time. Oh yeah, we're good. Um, the EPA multi-sector general permit and many other state ISGPs include natural background waiver provisions. Is ecology considering including this in the next permit? Seems important for nutrients and turbidity where these constituents can be naturally occurring in watersheds and groundwater. Likely not. And I, I say that only because um, the litigation around 9048 and how that comes into play on, on the Washington side is, is there really isn't that provision. I mean, you, you still can't violate the standard. Um, and so that's where that kind of comes in. Uh, I, I've seen those, those sort of provisions. Um, I think EPA actually got hammered on theirs pretty hard a couple of times with having that in there. Um, it's a very difficult thing to show and to prove that you're not, I mean, even though the background is there, um, that you're not still contributing, but you know, you're still responsible for coming off your site just because the, the river has a high turbidity and it doesn't mean we can put any more turbidity in there. Um, and so that's something that, you know, they're not really real crazy about putting in to the, to the permits. Okay, looks like, uh, do we have any other questions? Either in the chat or the Q and A, or if anybody wants to ask a question, um, please raise your hand uh, if you wanted to speak in person. Okay. Um, I think uh, we will provide um, Travis's uh, information um, and I'm gonna finish off here uh, with the rest of this presentation. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I hope these are the same permit permit managers. Is that correct, Travis? I think so, with the exception that um, Melinda Wilson is also a permit administrator, and and I the up if the website the ISGP website for ecology hasn't been updated yet, it will be shortly with the new county assignments. Um, but if if you if you're not sure who your administrator is um go to the the isgp webpage um just do ecology industrial stormwater general permit in google and it should be the first thing that pops up and towards the bottom is a list of of who to contact for what county okay. thank you um again here's the list of resources i will send this out also in an email so it'll be very accessible uh travis's contact information um I can also send that in the email so it's more accessible. A couple classes that we're doing right now, we do have a free um, webinar-based 100 basic building blocks of stormwater permit management that ECOS and Washington Stormwater Center did together. It's available online. Let me know if you'd like a link to it. It's kind of a nice, <clears throat> it has two parts and there's an exercise in the middle. Um, it's um, good for people who aren't necessarily the main permit manager, but helpful for a lot of um, people who are assisting managers, but also if you're just starting out, it's a kind of an easy step in to get into the understanding of the basics of the permit. We also have a series of four webinars we call 101 Stormwater Permit Management Fundamentals that goes over a variety of different things. It goes much more in depth than the free workshop. These are available through our website. Um, and uh, yeah, are there any additional uh, Q&A? 
I'm gonna have to let you do it, Lisa and uh, Carrie. Um, I'm sorry, what, <laughs> what did you want me to do? I apologize, I was- If there's any questions- Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, there's not currently. That's what I thought you meant, but I thought there was one here that I was missing. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I do wanna say thank you to um, Boeing and the Department of Ecology for helping us with this. Um, Boeing has been a supporter of ours for quite a long time and we really appreciate their support. Um, and we, we have ISGP resources on our website as well. So it's, um, it's here on the, the slide, it's wastormwatercenter.org. Um, and my address is there too, if you have any questions for me, um, in particular about the tire study. We have a lot of information about that. We are gonna be doing a Q and A on that um, because, or frequently asked questions on that because there are a lot of questions about that. Um, and a sort of a two page explanation of what the issue is and how we're working to solve it. So thank you again. All right, well, I think uh, at this point, since there's no more questions or uh, either in the chat or the Q&A, uh, we'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you, Travis. Thank you, Lori, for the funding for this. Lisa, for the partnership. And uh, we will be doing a follow-up. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or email me and we can follow up with Travis. Um, we did keep track of the list of questions today. So hopefully we can put those into a Q&A and have those available for you as well down the road. I will send a link for this presentation today so that you can have access the, to it and also share it to others. All right, thank you so much for your time.